But then there is the ignorance that you know the truth and you don't care about it and you keep on doing what you like. And that's two words kind of ignorance. The others are, you know, not the great others at all. I mean, people are ignorant of things. If somebody says, you know, I need to teach you something about the stars, I say yes, but I have no idea um, what they do. Because I'm ignorant in the subject. I might say, okay, I know about the particular thing, but I would have incorrect information. So I'm also ignorant because I have faulty information. And because then I get the correct information, I will adopt my views. And, and the idea here is that when Paul is writing here, don't forget that the Thessalonians, like all the other Christians, had no scripture except the Tanakh, which is what we say, what we call uh, the Old Testament. The first letter to the Thessalonians is the first letter, maybe the second, some scholars tell us that Galatians might be first, either or they did not have any scripture like we have today, so but the amount of information they've learned and comparing, you know, understanding that they were a church in the midst of a pagan culture. Those things that Paul is telling them, even in chapter 4, not to do. Like the latent sexual immoralities that went around in those days. So, you have a group of people traveling through Asia Minor and up going to Macedonia and Greece, a small group of people Paul and his team, you have Paul, you have Luke, the doctor, and you have Timothy and Silas. And they are preaching something contrary to what everybody else believed. And they go, you know, to Philippi, they got beaten there, they escaped to Thessalonica, the Paul's enemies followed him there, they had to fly away, I mean, run away um, to Berea and then he went to Athens and so forth. But wherever he went, wherever the steam went, they preached a gospel which was contra culture. And part of that culture, um, they did not believe that most pagans did not believe that there was an afterlife. And therefore, there were people who lived without hope. What's the point of life? As we heard in the testimony from John. What's the point of life? And even today, with all the knowledge that we hear, I once met, at least twice, two people that God brought to me just before they were going to commit suicide. One was a university student because they could not figure out the point of life. And the Thessalonians might have been wondering, what's the point of life? Those believers before died, what is going to happen to them? They were getting discouraged and saying, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. Or to grieve like the rest of the men who have no hope. So here, Paul is speaking about hope. He is encouraging them. And his encouragement is based, as we have seen, based on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we know that if Jesus rose again, so shall we. Paul uses a Greek word which refers to sleep, which many people take that um, as if literally sleeping. However, we know that it's a synonymous word. You can go and look it up in the dictionary, Greek dictionary, and was used regularly as instead of dying. It's like we say, he passed away, or he left us, or he went back to or he went to the fathers. Those are different words which means the night. Okay? 
What bothers me, though, is this, that there are groups of people that they call themselves Christians that believe that after we die, we become unconscious and we will not know what's going on, whether in heaven or hell, that there is no conscious feeling, and mainly the groups are the Jehovah Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists. What bothers me is not what the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah Witnesses teach, because I know where they come from, is why certain evangelical Christians, Pentecostal, are adapting this doctrine that when we die, and you can see it on Facebook, some of you, you may be friends with these people that are trying to spread this misunderstanding, that when we die, we sleep. What's so attractive to this doctrine? I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. However, I do read in the scripture that there is consciousness, and in fact, even when Paul said, it's better for me to go and be with the Lord than remain here. The Jesus teaching us about Lazarus and the rich man, and many other scriptures that shows us that when a person dies, he goes to be with the Lord and so forth, starting from the Old Testament. The point is, whether you are unconscious or conscious, at some point, Jesus is returning and he's going to raise those who died in him. So that with him, we will be going to the Father and spend eternity there. Now, that's basically what we believe with much more details, of course, about why we have hope instead of being discouraged with no hope. Interestingly enough, Gratzus' poem this week was about hope and discouragement. Something like that, right? Hope or What was despair. 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 Hope and despair. So here we are, and we all know, we all know that even if we ourselves are not clinging, holding on to the hope of the resurrection, we might be discouraged, we might become despair with what is going around us. The negativity of life, the contrary, the, what we hear, what we are being fed every day, the moment you open that television, that don't hear the news, we are being fed things which go contrary to the eternal plan of God. And those who love God, those who love the Bible, realize that and might get frustrated and get discouraged. However, if we put our minds on what God said, we heard today even about the song, Mold us. Break us and mold us. We need to be how Jesus wants us to be. We need to find that calling that God has given us because once we are there, we know where we are going and we will have no doubt about our end. We know that when Jesus comes, he wants to find us doing His will and doing what is good. So therefore, when we look at what the pagans used to think and what they used to say, for example, a common inscription on tombs was this. I was not. I became. I am not. I care not. This was an inscription of the, which describes people with no hope. Obviously because if we die, like even one of the scriptures said, we'll be like animals, we don't exist anymore. No. 
we are created in the image of God. We are created with a purpose and we've been called to be his ministers and serve him in our life. We are born in an age which we should be encouraged because God is trusting us to maintain and to preach the gospel of salvation to a generation which is trying to run away from the existence of God and His moral values. We know that this war against morality didn't start when a particular political party or parties came into power. It started in the Middle Ages, in the late um, 17th and 18th century, when we did, during the time of the Enlightenment, when these German philosophers, these German theologians, started coming up with this issue challenging the authority of the Bible, challenging the existence of Jesus, challenging the miracles, serves them right for not winning the game. And they are not in the final. Red card. Red card for me. Anyone mentions football today? I have to say it around. Um, so, another, another, um, Philosopher Theocritus wrote, he was a famous poet, he, he, he lived 300 years before Jesus Christ. He, he, he gives us a, a, an idea how people talk. Hopes are for the living, the dead are without hope. So this is what the culture was when the Thessalonians were looking around them trying to remember what Paul had taught them about their resurrection and their, what about those who died before us? Are they now lost? And Paul is teaching them and he's telling them later on that we that are still alive and that we that are still alive is very important which means Paul believed that any time Jesus could come the imminent coming of the Lord. Now, there are some Christians who don't believe that. Unfortunately. And we know that there are different ways of how people believe. And, uh, and as long as... I, I don't think I'm wrong, but as long as they believe Jesus is coming back, and we can have our differences and uh, at, at what time, at part of the timeline of God's eschatological plan, um, we fit. Now, some of us um, say or believe, and we have our reasons, which I will emphasize next week in what we believe, why we believe that before the tribulation, Jesus will come uh, and take away the church so that he will be able to pour out his wrath on all those who do not want to believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, this we find it twice in this book, in the first chapter and in chapter 4, that um, Jesus is coming and what we actually find is that we are not destined to the wrath of God. Now, um, I don't know, um, I don't know if I mentioned this now or the other side, but I can't remember, but and I don't know if Paul mentioned to them the things that were going to happen in the book of Revelation. Remember, they didn't have the book of Revelation. It was written at least 50 years later by John the Apostle. So I don't know and nobody can know how much they knew about God's wrath. But we know. And it's not pleasant. And although I want, want to explain this on our Bible studies on Tuesdays, when we see what's happening around us, we can see the signs that Jesus mentioned that things will happen before His return. Remember when Jesus was speaking, was answering the question of the apostles, what will be the sign? 
or signs of your uh, before your second coming, and he was giving them a, a list of things, and a few of them were it will be time of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now we live it. Now we are living it. It's the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. We are living it because people change their values. Because we allow the spirit of the Antichrist to the European Union to change our values. And far before Malta entered the European Union, the teaching of scholars were telling us what will happen near the end times. And they are happening. As an interpretation of the scripture compared with politics. We now there will be time of the times of Noah. So what does this teach us? And we can see it. Marriage has no value at all today. I was hearing a, a program on TV last Monday. I just reached the, the last part of it. A, a particular lawyer and was speaking about the disaster of marriages, the breaking up of marriages. And although this lawyer I know is not a born again Christian, I know he is not, but they were saying because there are no more values. And then you have a politician who says, we have our European values, referring to homosexuality. Those are not Christian values, those are the Antichrist values. And we have, we are living in this time, that might discuss it, but we are living in a time we can take every opportunity and say, listen, those are Satan's values. Christ's values are these. Whether they believe it, whether they accept it, whether they talk back to you, maybe in a degrading way, but it is our opportunity to speak against the evil of these days, knowing that when Jesus comes, they have no hope. But by preaching the gospel, you are giving them the chance to repent and then have hope. I put it on Facebook. Everybody can see it. I made a reply to this particular, and I said, listen. I said, this guy is doing the devil's work. I said, although I cannot start my doing it, I need to pray for this guy. Have you read that? But I don't feel like praying for him. I pray maybe one prayer, maybe two prayers very quickly. And I can, I am confessing my, my weakness to him. He is so evil, in my opinion. He is evil. But that's, that's the system of the world today. That's what Jesus spoke about. Wars, rumors of wars. We find people worshipping the earth, trying to save the earth. Nobody is going to save the earth. Jesus said, Three, one third of all the trees will burn. Jesus said, one third of the seas will get polluted. Nobody is going to save the world. The only thing that can save the world is the world gets saved, which is not going to happen. But these are all signs pointing to us that any time Jesus is coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you believe Jesus can come today? Hundred percent. Even before the game? Yes. 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 <laughs> well, if, if, if English is going to lose, better come before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so I hope you understood what I put on the, on the, okay? Because some, some took it seriously. <laughs> um, all right, brothers, we might believe like we do, that Jesus will come before the tribulation. Some believe that Jesus will come in the middle of the tribulation. Some believe that we, Jesus will come after the tribulation. And the three believe that there 
experienced a 1,000 year reign of Christ. But some don't believe nothing of this, and they don't even believe that the millennium is something future of the future, but they believe that right now we are in the millennium, which is contrary um, to what the scripture, how the scripture describes it, um, the millennium. Um, but as far as I know, um, the Roman Catholic Church is like that, the Presbyterian Church is like that, and some evangelical are, are becoming like this. Um, and the point is, as far as I know, they all believe that Jesus is returning. This is important, brothers, because the resurrection of Christ and the second coming of Christ were always important topics of the church. Even in the first and third century, first to say, we find people in the church writing the creeds. And the most important creeds, like the Apostle Creed, the Messiah Creed, the Anatasian Creed, they all refer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be very foolish for us not to believe them. And I'm saying foolish, not that does, we don't believe mentally, because mentally we all believe, but then if I believe that Jesus is coming back, I must live in the way I expect Jesus to find me, or expect how Jesus expects to find me. And that's why in Titus we realize that when Jesus returns, Paul calls this the blessed hope, the blessed hope, not just hope, the blessed hope, waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ, for our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we wait for this blessed hope, Jesus wants to find us doing what is right, doing what we're supposed to do as believers. Living a Christian life, being the light of the world. And God will come and will find us doing that. And we imagine when we go and we cut off for the sudden and I will be preaching on this next week, God willing, and you will tell or will say to us, Come in, my faithful self. What a wonderful greetings we will have. When we are greeted by Jesus himself. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine someone you admire in life and invites you to his home or her home and say, I am so blessed you visited me. And in your heart you say, I am the one blessed visiting you. Huh? It's like, you know, when I was invited by the president. Oh, you know. So I put on my best clothes, my, my tie, you know. Check it was it's moving. Yeah, you are there. <laughs> okay? Well, the president invited us, you know, us there. Yeah. Imagine the King of Kings inviting us sinners, saved by his grace, and calling us faithful servants. When deep in our heart we know many times we did we've not been that. But His grace covers you all. His grace, His grace is sufficient for us. So God bless you, brothers and sisters. And as much as I, you know, wish you enjoying the evening, the afternoon, the game, and whatever, but don't forget that Jesus, Jesus is returning to us. Amen. And we need to be waiting for the second time. So whether um, we eat or drink or do something else, let us know for the glory of God. God bless you.